And in the name of the, uh, the president and the board of the Middle East Institute, I'd like to welcome you today to today's events, uh, a discussion with uh, Ambassador Nabil Fahmi uh, on uh, the broad title of the Middle East's need for domestic reform and regional statecraft. Uh, Ambassador Fahmi, I'm sure, is known uh, to many of you. Uh, he's a long-serving uh, former ambassador of Egypt to the United States from 1999 to 2008, uh, very eventful years, including the events of 9-11 uh, and all those, uh, the aftermath of all of that. Uh, during that time, he was also chairman of the UN Secretary General's Advisory Board on Disarmament Issues, where he worked on uh, 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 those uh, uh, host of issues on disarmament uh, with the UN. Uh, after serving in the, uh, in the US, he returned to Egypt and uh, uh, from July 2013 to June 2014, uh, he was Egypt's foreign minister under President Mansour and uh, current President uh, uh, Sisi. Uh, and he helped uh, Egypt navigate, again, very difficult uh, conditions regionally and internationally. He had a brief entry into political life in Egypt in the Constitution Party, led by Mohammed al baradei uh, but otherwise, I think he is uh, known by most of you uh, uh, for his diplomatic career in the UN, in the US, uh, and in Egypt. He will speak to us uh, for 10 to 15 minutes, an opening statement about issues of domestic reform and regional statecraft. After that, I will engage him in, uh, in a short conversation, question and answer. And then, of course, we will turn it over to questions uh, from the audience. Uh, we do have to end promptly at 1.15. Uh, so I'll thank you in the Q&A to keep the comments and questions uh, very brief. And with that, uh, Ambassador Fahmi, I turn the podium to you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. And Wendy, thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, thank you all for coming. I see so many of my old friends. I wonder why you won't listen to me again. Uh, I'm, I've been saying the same thing for a number of years now. Uh, I'm going to try to be brief, and I'm saying this because I tend to be a little bit long-winded, and also because there's some, so much happening that the topic is, is very extensive. So I'm going to touch on a number of points. Uh, they may sound provocative, but they're all made in the positive sense, with the view not to criticize, but with the view to make things better. That's really what concerns me. And as much as I'm happy to say them here in Washington, Washington's a very important place uh, for us to make these comments, uh, they're uh, primarily topics that are of concern to, uh, to the Arab world uh, and to my own country in particular. So I say, I make this point just to make, make the point that I say exactly the same thing back home. I don't have a different speech for here uh, that I would do back home. It's exactly what I say here. Uh, what annoys people back home may annoy you here, or other things may annoy you here. Uh, that's not what bothers me. Uh, what, bother, what I really try to do is to try to get people to work together and to think together, and ultimately, uh, we are, I think, centrist in the world community, and therefore we all tend to win, win, or lose, lose in the, lo in the longer stake of issues. Uh, what happened in the Middle East over the last five years, in particular the Arab Middle East, my, is my focus, and uh, why and where we should go from there. Quickly, uh, first question is, why did we do revolution rather than evolution? My answer is simple. Change was imminent. It was something that was going to happen, uh, something that was needed. Uh, the issue is when, where, and how. Uh, the reason for the change, uh, you have a huge youth bulge in the Middle East, in the Arab Middle East, and that's a good bulge. Uh, youth want change. Uh, secondly, you have a technological revolution which allows everyone in the street to be better connected and therefore get information, influence information, much more than they could in the past throughout the world, including the Middle East. So people gain power much more than they had 
in the past. You had problems of bad governance, which led to the breakdown of the social contract between the governing and the governed. Uh, and therefore, the change brought with it not necessarily a positive trend, but also a sense of friction because of these issues uh, of bad governance. And finally, you had a managing change deficiency in the Middle East. In other words, how do you move from one phase to the other? How do you move from one uh, form of government to the other, from one uh, series of practices to the other? And if you look at the four countries, four republics in particular, but the four countries that witnessed uh, the most serious trends of, cha of change, be that in Tunis, Libya, Egypt, and in Yemen, and I can add to that, frankly, Syria as well, although it's a little bit different. Uh, the, the lifespan of the governments there, and I'm talking here about the heads of state, in particular in politics, was somewhere between 30 and 40 years. Well, if you've been in the same place for 30 to 40 years, and you have to look at a new world, you're obviously not going to be very comfortable with trying to change. Uh, and if you have these problems after 30 years, then you haven't done a very good job in managing the change anyway. And the social contract has broken down. Now, that's really what I believe is the fundamental reason behind the amount of domestic turmoil that has existed in the Arab world over the last five years. I'm not, frankly, someone who believes that this process has failed. I'm not someone who believes, I will not claim it succeeded. That would be ridiculous to, to say that. But I think it's a process that's ongoing. And uh, if you look at transformations of this magnitude anywhere in the world historically, it never happens in five years. It never happens in three years. Uh, it's more a, a, a decade or several decade long uh, process, especially when, especially when you don't have a regional player that you want, to, or a mo regional mod model that you want to emulate. When people say, well, East Europe did it this way, East Europeans wanted to be West Europeans. That was their model. So it was a, it was a logical model that they wanted to emulate. In the Middle East, it was different. Egypt was the pioneer of nation state system in the Middle East. Egypt was the centrist pioneer in the Middle East. We were the, the modern example of nationhood in the Middle East. If we're going through our own transformation, we have no one to follow, and there's nobody for the Arabs to follow because we're going through our own transformation. Uh, so I think it's, it's not credible to argue that the Arab transformations have succeeded, and I think it's not rational or objective to argue that they have failed. I think it's a process of transformation that continues to be ongoing, and it depends on what we do with it in the next decade, rather than uh, only in what we did or didn't do in the past. Now, I can give you specific examples of why we've had problems, but I, I want to focus more on the general issues. Now, the other issue is, well, why was this so complicated on a regional context. In my first few comments, we're focused on the domestic situation in each of these countries. If you look at it regionally, you hit a different deficiency. Now, if we had a managing change deficiency domestically, you had a national security delinquency, or deficit for that matter, regionally. The overdependence on foreign powers on issues of national security created many of the countries in the region to depend on a regional power or a international foreign power, not only the West, but including the West, of course, and particularly the West, but in, before that it was the Soviet Union and then Russia and so on. Uh, and therefore, each one of the Arab Middle Eastern states did not properly accommodate itself in terms of, well, how do you define your national security? What proportion is that is safeguarded by your own domestic capacities? What proportion is safeguarded by regional capacities? And what proportion is, is safeguarded by, hey, how are you? Is, is safeguarded by uh, international relations. As a result of that, 
during the last five years, you've seen the prominence of Turkey and Iran in particular at the expense of traditional player, Arab players in the Middle East. Uh, so this national security uh, deficit is, I think, uh, a, another element that is unique really to uh, the Middle East, and it's also one of the r main reasons behind our tendency to look for conspiracies. Look for them because they exist, but we look for them because we find so many parties playing in our domestic or sub-regional affairs, but forget the fact that we're the ones who encourage them to play that role, and therefore we're to blame for why they're becoming stakeholders in this process. I'm not a big fan of conspiracy theory, but when you're 7,000 years old, you assume that there have been a couple of conspiracies here and there, uh, and, and you try to look for why they existed in the Middle East and why uh, they succeeded or they didn't succeed. That's why you have a situation, for example, in Syria, where while this was a Syrian civil war to start off with, it's a, geo a geopolitical regional battle now among regional players in the Middle East, and it's an international geopolitical battle between international players at the same time. Uh, less so internationally in Yemen, but it's equally so regionally. If you, you have the situation in Libya, where you have a failed state in Libya, uh, which has moved from one leader without any government to a country today that has two governments and they're working on a third or trying to merge them together to make a third one, uh, a parliament in one part of the country and not in the other. Uh, and in spite of all these institutions, you don't actually have anybody who has any authority to control or manage. Uh, and then if you follow the, the intelligence trend that is uh, out there in the public domain, I know that's an, a, a sort of contradiction in terms, but you hear stories about so many different Western powers having special forces here and there in Libya, and you have different stories about how many different non-state parties are active in Libya, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and you name it, everybody else uh, as well. And then to try to imagine a model where you bring all these people together to be rational and apply good governance, you have to appreciate that this is not going to happen in the short term, and it's not going to happen only by sub-regional corporation, for example, Tunis, Algeria, and Egypt, but they have to play a role, but it's also going to have to involve uh, regional states, excuse me, uh, international uh, partners, especially the Europeans, but also, frankly, the, the major powers, and the Libyans uh, themselves. So these problems today are simply so complicated, and domestic and regional politics have intermingled with each other that while as a former diplomat we were always told and often repeated that foreign policy starts back home and is domestic policy, uh, today we actually live it in the sense that our domestic policy is affected immediately by foreign policy. All of that being said, I believe the Middle East is changing. It will change for the better or for the worse, depending on if Middle Eastern states decide to take more, more responsibility in governing their own affairs. I'm not an isolationist. I don't believe we can do it alone. But if we continue to overly depend on others, then we will ultimately put international political agenda ahead of our own, and that does, does not work. Secondly, if we continue to believe that we can manage our affairs differently or in a, fa in a fashion that's inconsistent with international norms and principles, we'll be making a major mistake. Today's societies, because of technology, most of all, uh, are much more transparent. And when you create a transparent political system, it then generates accountability. And when you bring in the element of accountability, then you have to bring in the basic tenets of good governance. So while I'm not suggesting at all 
that Middle, Middle Easterners, Arab Middle Easterners, have to become all kingdoms or all republics or models of parliamentary systems or presidential systems as they are in the West. Uh, they have to have better governance uh, domestically, they have to be more transparent, and they have to be consistent with international norms on how these issues uh, are being met because we will be held accountable by our own people. With all due respect to all of you guys, you, for, I don't spend much time on what you think. My focus is mostly on what my Egyptian colleagues think and then how that reflects internationally as well. If I was to do it the other way around, it would be frankly uh, illogical. So I, I call frequently for more active domestic engagement in domestic reform back home as a response to domestic needs and requests, not as a response to foreign needs and requests. Uh, I also believe because that's where technology is taking us, whether we like it or not. The debates that you have in Egypt today when, I, mean, I used to joke when I was in government that we had 90 million at the time, I think now we're at 91, but we had 90 million uh, Egyptians and we had 92 million different foreign ministers uh, because everybody had an opinion and everybody wanted to express himself and everybody did. And while I may or may not have liked it, it was the reality. So unless I address those issues publicly in a transparent fashion, I could not engage in the debate uh, or I could not influence enough the, the, the stakeholders so that I could pursue the right policies. My second point is the regional problems that I mentioned and one which I didn't mention, which is the Palestinian-Israeli track in particular, can really be the beginning of a horrific, catastrophic period in not only Middle Eastern history, if left undone, uh, because they will not only have the ramifications of, of traditional regional conflicts, but they go to the core of who we are the core of the identity of the regional countries. I mean, Middle Easterners, Arabs in particular, love to hate the Sykes-Picot agreements. And they love to blame the Sykes-Picot maps uh, for everything. Now, I'm not a big supporter of Sykes-Picot, uh, but the actual maps being used now are not the ones drawn up by Sykes-Picot, by the way. Uh, there was a side deal that people sort of ignored. That being said, I strongly oppose any attempt to redefine the Arab states based on anything but the national identity. It would lead to a, a domino effect of horrendous uh, 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 ramifications and implications if we just decided to define people on the basis of their faith, uh, their ethnic background, and we need to stick to the nation state system as good and as bad as it may be. We need to do it better, in other words, emphasize that the na national identity is the one that governs the day, but at the same time, everybody in that national theater has to find equal rights and equal opportunity as members of that particular state. Uh, opening the door for redefining identity, frankly, simply is just too complicated and would lead to a tremendous amount of, uh, of security problems throughout uh, the region. I want to address the issue of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict as well. It's regrettably being ignored, and I would argue it's being ignored for two reasons. One, which is very cynical and immoral, is that the other problems in the region are more bloody than this one for the time being. Um, and that's not a reason, in my mind, to drop dealing with uh, an attempt to provide people with their rights, in other words, the Palestinians, uh, the right to nationhood, and to deal with violations of international law, which occupation is, and the Israeli occupation is a clear example of it. Uh, it's the longest ongoing conflict in the region, and it's not going to go away. It's going to come back and hit us right in the face uh, at, at a time when we uh, will not choose to 
um, because we haven't chosen to engage in it, when in actual fact we were very, very close to resolving this uh, in years past. And I, given my provocative nature and the fact that I'm leaving tomorrow anyway, uh, let me suggest that while President Obama said that one of his biggest mistakes was not thinking about the day after in Libya a few days ago, I would argue also that not pursuing a full package on peace between Arabs and Palestini Palestinians and Israelis in his first year in office was another big mistake. And that at that point in time, there was opportunity to really achieve success in this regard. In looking towards the future, I look inwards more than I look outwards as, as an Arab, as an Egyptian, because that's really where success or failure will, uh, will occur. If you don't do that right, there's no way you can solve the regional or international issues. If you do that part right, then you have a chance in dealing with the other complications that are associated with international relations. Again, I would argue that if you don't want to be pressured into doing things by international agenda, you have to have more dependency on your own assets, your own capabilities. And uh, I'm going to close with, with a comment that the Arab awakening rather than the Arab Spring, I think still have a way to go. You're going to have some successes and, and some failures, but just the mere fact that there is an awakening, the mere fact that Arabs are engaged or trying to get engaged, even with all the mistakes that exist, in determining their future, I think is a positive. And I think it's one step in the right direction. It's not enough, and we've made too many mistakes in the process, but I think it's a step in the right direction. And uh, I hope it will be coupled with uh, more active uh, Arab diplomacy and uh, more active Arab expression of Arab suggestions to solutions to the regional problems uh, as a basis for negotiations. Uh, my own country for years uh, has played a leading political role in the region. We have been busy over the last five years, but that's not reason uh, not to resume uh, that role. The uh, region is not going to wait until we finish uh, uh, stabilizing our situation domestically. And I think we've gone a significant step in that direction. But I also believe that in the absence of a active regional conflict resolution role by Egypt, the, there's a huge vacuum in the Middle East that really can't be covered by anybody else uh, in the region. So I'm, uh, I appreciate the concerns we have and the issues we have, but I honestly believe that uh, more has to be done by regional players, particularly Egypt. Uh, I think the meetings recently in Egypt between uh, the Egyptian leadership and the Saudi leadership have been useful, and I know this is gonna give me a question, but I'm gonna leave that to the, to the floor. Uh, without that foundation, that foundation of cooperation with our agreements and our disagreements, with both of them, uh, this region will not stabilize. And ultimately, to stabilize, we need to have a different kind of dialogue and relationship with our non-Arab members of the Middle East. Uh, I put the onus mostly on the non-Arab members of the Middle East because I think their actions have been more egregious towards Arabs than any Arab actions have been towards them. And I'm mentioning specifically here Iran, Turkey, and Israel. Uh, but unless you have some movement on the Iranian-Saudi relationship and some movement on the Turkish-Egyptian relationship, and I don't see movement happening in the short term, uh, we're still going to have some, some difficult problems to come. So I'd encourage very much uh, some diplomacy on some confidence building measures to create an environment for a, a more serious debate about this. I can speak for the another hour and keep you all waiting. So let me simply stop there and answer any questions uh, <coughs> that you might have, and that's probably better for me to move on. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Ambassador Fahmy. Uh, interesting and wide-ranging uh, reflections and comments. Uh, and I'm going to take the liberty of shooting a few questions your way. I'll start with questions about how you see the issue of what you started with, this historic shifts and changes in the Arab world. Uh, the last five years, which you, as you said, described not, you know, effectively a full failure, but hard to describe as a success. Uh, obviously, as you said, these are old regimes with old institutions uh, coming up against uh, a very young population and one that is very informed and empowered. If you looked down the road, 5, 10, 15 years, uh, how, where do you see potential for positive change, elements of hope, and what is... Egypt's potential role in that. As you said, there is no current model in the region. Uh, Egypt obviously is the biggest, and if Egypt changed, of course, that would create a lot of change. But there's much sort of concern that Egypt today is, is somewhat stuck uh, in its attempt at, uh, at political change. Do you see hope in other parts of the region, or do you see any path forward for Egypt in terms of a more democratic transformation? I know when I answer the question, you're all going to say, well, he's saying that because he's Egyptian. I can't deny I'm Egyptian, so that's a, that's a fact. <laughs> I'll start with that. Uh, when I talk about Egypt's role, I talk about Egypt's role because I think it benefits, e benefits Egypt, and secondly, because we have a responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the region to do that. It's not um, because I'm being chauvinistic, but well, occasionally I can be. Um, where is the potential to move forward? I, again, I, I, I believe we're being driven by technology. Nobody has full power, as we had in the past. If you look at the debates every day in Egypt today, every day, uh, among supporters of what the government does and among oppo uh, people who oppose what the government does, every day we're having a lively debate about something. Uh, just recently, we've had a lively debate about the recent visits. So just the fact that people are challenging the normal state of play uh, even, if the even if the government isn't leading the debate, they can't ignore the debate. What I'd like to see is that the government move from, okay, I'm going to respond to this debate, to I'm going to lead the debate. In other words, bring out the policy issues openly to the people and have them debate that. Because if you don't, and I say this from my own experience, they're going to come out anyway. So rather than having to deny what did exist or what didn't exist, I would come out and say, well, this is my policy, this is what I want to do. And in, in this field, if you're 70% right, you're a genius. So I'm not really worried about that. Are we where we would like to be on the issue of openness, if you want reform? No, of course not. I mean, what, five years ago, we all wanted to be well ahead of where we are now. And it may, be, may have been, because we were all naive about what could be done so quickly. Uh, and I don't d d uh, ignore my own situation as well. We all wanted more. Um, and we need to, do, to fix what needs to be fixed. But I honestly believe that the continuous corrective process, even when there are mistakes, you can still see that quite uh, evidently, um, the debates even about issues of civil liberties and domestic reforms, frankly, they're more active domestically than they are internationally. So the idea that Egyptians are happy or not happy with a particular government me measure, it's in the media every day, and it comes from all over the place. Uh, it would have been better if we had resolved these issues beforehand, but if we don't, then uh, one shouldn't assume that this corrective process is not going to continue. You, you asked me about Egypt's role. I, as I said, for me, I'm never going to suggest that, having been a traditionalist in terms of foreign policy, that we go around trying to promote our form of government regionally. But I think the best way to do that is to try to create the example that most Arabs would want to emulate at least partially. Uh, when we were really playing the, the, the only pioneering role in the Arab world, it was because we were ahead of the curve. When they wanted to achieve something, they would look at Egypt first and then the West or Asia second and third. We need to get back to that. And that means 
fixing ourselves domestically. I think we're on track. We just make too many mistakes in doing that. But I think the direction uh, is right. There's no question that there are problems. There are problems of the debate about political Islam versus secularism. There's the problems about economic priorities. We have a very difficult employment situation. Uh, you have economic needs, uh, which require a large n amount of investment and exports, and it's very difficult to get that when you have a region that's on fire. Uh, I know I said this in, 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 in an event this morning. Uh, but w when you say you, you think that maybe Egypt, hopefully, is on the right track, on the political side, where do you see that, uh, that, that hope materialized? Uh, is it through political institutions? I mean, you discussed there is a debate. Yes, people are, you know, there is, because of the internet and so on, you, there's, there's uh, you know, discussions and debates. But institutionally, whether it's through parliamentary elections or the translation of the generally a pretty good constitution into actual fact sure. or the next presidential election, at the end of the day, these things matter, and yet everything seems somewhat top-down and very much uh, rigid and controlled. And the fear is that that might lead to another explosion rather than, in other words, Egypt doesn't have 20 years to get it sure. right. It's a lot of pressure there. It's a great question. But let's look at things realistically. I'm not particularly happy with how far we've gone five years after 2011. So as an Egyptian, I wanted to see more happen. But if you look at, talking about institutions, parliament was just elected. And a lot of, many, many of us had reservations about the process itself, although the election itself was not questionable. But what did the parliament do that people assumed was going to rubber stamp every proposal by the government? The first thing they did was reject a new civil service law. So this supposedly rubber stamping parliament that was supposed to say yes to everything the government said, the first decision they said was to say no. So it's not perfect when we can do better. But the idea that we haven't put institutions there, no, we have. Now, we need to move now from your excellent point about institution building to actually develop, developing a political culture that is not only pluralistic in its constitution, but in its ethics. In other words, we agree on some things, we disagree on some things. As long as we all agree that this is the constitution of the nation state we're talking about, we can have as heated debates as you want within that constitution. And there is movement on in, in, in that direction. Now, uh, if you look at the debate in the media, really across the board, again, even about recent visits to Egypt. Uh, but are we perfect? No. There's no question that the youth movements in particular feel frustrated that they wanted to see more by, by 2016. So we just have to keep working on it. Last point on the domestic, domestic situation. I mean, in a sense, if you want to you know, summarize in an unrealistic way, there's sort of the liberal democratic camp to some degree, uh, various stripes of Islamists, and maybe the state and the statist sort of institutions. In the early period of the Arab, of the Egyptian <coughs> revolution, uprising, awakening, whatever you want to call it, uh, obviously the youth and many like yourselves and so on were part of what could be broadly defined as kind of a liberal democratic uh, trend. And yet, perhaps, you know, lack of previous party organization or, you know, the suddenness of the moment, not enough unity, not enough organization, uh, and ended up the Islamists winning elections, the state coming back, and most of the politics since then betw being between those two very powerful camps. Um, if you were to look forward in Egypt, where is that you know, a very diverse camp today. Some are, you know, disillusioned and left, some have left politics, some maybe are, you know, not allowed to talk, some are in jail, some are, some are active, uh, and yet the, f the hope is in, in many of those people. Sure. Again, let me give you a specific example, because you, you, you correctly mentioned the Constitution before. Uh, parliament is the only organization that can change the Constitution, at least the first step towards doing that. Nevertheless, a number of public citizens decided to establish a, a foundation to safeguard the Constitution. It wasn't that we're not going to go and defend the Constitution against anybody. It was basically what we believe in the Constitution, and therefore we're going to look at the different laws that have been adopted in the past or will be adopted in the future, and to see whether they meet 
the standard that is required in this regard. The, this is not to take anybody else's role, but it is to play a proactive role. In, nation building is complicated, it's difficult, and it's about convincing people of your opinion as much as it is in listening to that of others. It's going to take time. Uh, if I think our biggest mistake, and that's why we have all this the delay, had we post-2011 immediately postponed the election process and focused on establishing a constitution first, taking a year and a half to two years and developing an a inclusive, liberal constitution, uh, you would have allowed Egyptians to come around one message, different detail, but one identity of what Egypt was. We regrettably jumped to the conclusion of let's go through the process of democracy, which is elections, rather than establish the foundation of a democracy, which is the constitution. And when you did that, then what you immediately did was whoever is more organized on the ground takes charge, and then you got into the identity clash again and you started all over again. So uh, your point is, is well taken. Because of the mistakes, we're all dispersed all over the place. But what I argue with people is, I know you're frustrated, so am I. Uh, but we can only fix this if we all engage in this, argue the case over and over again in a positive construction fashion. And I actually think that by doing that, uh, people listen. And I, actually, and I can give you hundreds of examples of, you know what, you seem to sound like an oddball coming up with this issue, but there may be some validity to this. Is there some resistance? Of course. I mean, I made the point at the beginning. There is this uh, mismanagement of change or the delinquency in the managing change. So the old traditional institutions don't want to move as quickly as, frankly, transparency and technology forces us all to move. My kids and my grandchildren, my grandchildren not yet, but I mean my, I have grandchildren, but they're not that old yet, uh, don't hold me to the standard of what did my father do? <laughs> they hold me to the standard of what, what's happening in Italy, what's happening in Taiwan, what's happening in China. So, and I can't tell them, well, we're not living in China or we're not living in Italy. Uh, that's because of transparency and technology. Mm -hmm. I want to ask a couple of questions uh, uh, about foreign policy, uh, both regional and international. Uh, for the past, you know, since World War II, there's been a number of phases. For a while, the Middle East was sort of governed by Cold War superpower alignments. After the Cold War, there was kind of a period of American dominance, mm -hmm. whether it was Pax Americana or Conflict Americana, <laughs> they were very powerful. And uh, with this administration, a clear sort of, you know, uh, uh, somewhat uh, retreat from the Middle East. This obviously is a risk and an opportunity. The opportunity is that, as you say, the, the powers in the region can take charge of their own affairs. Uh, we saw King Salman's visit, uh, a long visit to Egypt this the past few days, and he went straight from Egypt to, to Turkey for meetings with Turkish officials, also to the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Um, my question is twofold. One is the region initially seems to be organizing into a regional conflict system, like Iran and its allies, and Saudi Arabia, whatnot, Egypt and its allies, engaged in proxy war in Syria and Yemen and Lebanon and uh, in Iraq, hopefully not somewhere else. Uh, yet at the same time, this is an opportunity, as you indicated, to reach out for them to reach out, you know, whether it's Iran, Turkey, Israel, it's an opportunity to build a regional order. Uh, how do you see, you know, what's happening right now, the Saudi efforts, long visit to Egypt, visit to Turkey? I just heard that uh, the Egyptian representation to Turkey will be at the level of the foreign minister, which is might be a little... Uh, little development there, any improvement in Egyptian-Turkish relations. How do you see the regional order or the regional disorder taking shape, and what, what's Egypt's role in that? Uh, two or three points. One is that you can't get a regional order until the Arab countries put their own house in order. Otherwise, they are, will be at a, uh, in, in, in a in a weak position vis-a-vis -vis the non-Arab countries in the region, and that's why you see the prominence of the three non-Arab states over the last few years. Uh, once you establish that better Arab order within 
domestically and regionally, uh, they will be in a better place to be constructive, to be self-confident, and to engage with their non-Arab parties, who are not going away, by the way. They've been, mm -hmm. Many of them have been there for a long time, and they will be there for a long time. I've always been a proponent of, of engaging um, the non-Arab members, but that does not mean that I ignore the fact that they, there are legitimate concerns about their actions, uh, Saudis vis-a-vis -vis Iran, and our case in Egypt vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. Uh, I can draft for you a solution to all of those problems, but none of the parties will read it until the end of the page. Because the environment is not conducive to, it's not about a miracle man developing language. It's about creating the environment where you can have a process with going at a, at a subject 10, 15 times until you get some variation on your theme. Therefore, the step into that, in my mind, is confidence building measures. Confidence building measures that allow the Saudis to be a bit more comfortable that the Iranians are not going to interfere in their internal affairs, particularly in the Gulf area, and vice versa, also uh, Turkey vis-a-vis -vis Egypt, uh, Egypt feels comfortable that they will not feel interfere in, in our internal affairs. Now, it's going to take time. So I don't suggest a formula, I suggest a process of dealing with this. And I don't think that any, but I don't, I would not ignore, I mean, don't assume this can't happen. If you see some progress in Yemen, you see some progress in Syria, and somebody's talking to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, my last question will be about the Egyptian-American relationship. Uh, President Obama started his presidency with a big speech in Cairo. Mm -hmm. Many events intervened, and I guess you, you know, the relationship now is cold at best, uh, not many months left in the Obama administration. Uh, if you were to look ahead, uh, and if you were to advise the Egyptian government and the next American President, as to how to put this relationship right, how to, you know, what can be done uh, uh, to improve, strengthen. Uh, you're a long serving ambassador here. If you were here in, during the transition, what would your words of advice be to both sides? Well, giving advice to one president is difficult enough, giving it to two is. <laughs> but let me answer the question because it's a serious question. I've asked repeatedly back home, given the American elections, how should we play this game? What should we do? And my answer repeatedly across the board is just focus on getting your domestic house in order and, and in playing your regional role in the Middle East. And the new American president, he or she, will react to this new reality. If we're not playing the role, will be assessed as a party that cannot play the role. If we have uh, domestic problems, then they will look at this as, as a situation that's unstable. So, and I, and I make these points not for America's reasons, but because they serve Egypt, first of all. And they serve our ability to play our role regionally, and it's how Americans will, will look at us. Uh, so that's w how I would say, what I would say to Egyptians. To Americans, I would argue that this is not a transactional relationship. And it's not one, I would argue that stop playing tactics and try to look at the Middle East strategically. You're not going to get models in the Middle East that fit your model. And frankly, as a Middle Easterner, I wouldn't want to do that. Because there are things that I think in your model that are very successful, and other things I don't want to do. Uh, but that being said, look at this as a relationship that goes on where you're going to have agreements, you're going to have difficulties. It's not about if the Egyptians or the, the, the Syrians or the Saudis are doing what America likes, therefore the relationship is important. And if it's not, then it's unimportant. It's important in both cases. The only issue is here we have a difference of opinion and here we have, we have an agreement. Uh, I don't think in a global environment, irrespective of the issue of oil, uh, that America, being a global power, can ignore the Middle East. And I don't think from a global environment, a country like Egypt, uh, that has a regional role and is engaged internationally, can ignore America. 
So, but I would look at this as a strategic relationship with ups and downs. It has to be managed better, looking more towards the future, uh, founded on government-to-government -government relations, but with a much better understanding of domestic politics on both sides. And I would argue this in particular. Uh, frankly, I'm not sure Americans understand this either, but we don't really understand your elections. Uh, but that being said, I can tell you that very few Americans understand politics in the, in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. I know you have hundreds of Middle Eastern experts that have sort of come out of the woodwork these days, <laughs> but that they actually know what the trends are. I, as an Egyptian, I can tell you, I'm not sure what the trends in my own country will be 10 years from now, because the transformation we've had over the last five years was so sudden and so great that it, it sort of pushes you back into a sense of humility. Okay, maybe you thought you had all the answers, but if you did, it wouldn't have happened this way. So let's be sort of more respectful to each other as we move forward. Uh, well, you've all been very patient. Uh, so we will go to questions from the audience. Uh, please be very brief. Let me stand up so I can see people. I'll start uh, with the gentleman in the back in the red sweatshirt. Hi, uh, Amr Khod from the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the corrective process you had mentioned and uh, moving in the right direction. Uh, Mr. Salem had asked you a little bit about it. Um, and I guess I wanted to hear a little bit more details or kind of some hard info about what you think about that. Me as an observer, I don't really see um, things headed in the right direction in the least bit. Um, I think, you know, security standpoint, I think that's worsened considerably. There's hard data to support that. Uh, the situation with civil society has, has been deteriorating, so in the economy as well. So it'd be great to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you, and Ambassador, if you could take notes to the, of the questions, I'll take a few. Uh, the lady on the left there. Hi, I'm Debbie Alvis. I'm an international consultant. Um, Your Excellency, one key aspect of the Egyptian economy is the military's control of about half of it. Um, that's presented all kinds of problems for economic development in Egypt, but it also presents some issues of security and con security concerns for both Egypt internally and externally. Would you please address that? Is that something that you think the government is intent on doing? Thank you. Uh, the gentleman on the second row, I know there's a lot of people with questions. I'm doing my best. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mohammed Tanamli. I'm a foreign service officer retired with AID. Uh, during your tenure, as you know, uh, the U.S. government gave uh, the government of Egypt about $815 million and $1.2 million billion in military assistance. Eight, 800 and 1.2. Uh, for many years, that was the uh, Camp David arrangement. Uh, currently, uh, a lot of people think that uh, $1.2 billion is really uh, doesn't serve uh, the Egyptian uh, you know, need. Uh, on the borders with Israel, obviously, there are no fights. On Libya, there may be some skirmishes. In Sudan, it's safe. So why, as an advisor, uh, couldn't we switch, maybe make, Egypt fights a guerrilla campaign with some of the bad guys, as you know. So why can't we switch the rest for economic development that will help the, uh, the quality of life of the poor Egyptian? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marina Ottaway, fourth, third row. Thank you. Mary in Ottawa with the Wilson Center. I'd like to take you back to a conversation we had a long time ago. It was probably about, uh, probably the first year after the uprising. And you s we were talking about what had happened. And you said, and this is something that really stuck in my mind, this was a revolution fought by the children on behalf of their parents. And what I'd like to ask you, do you still feel that way? In other words, is there, <clears throat> are the generations still on the same wavelength? Is there a gap that has grown between the two? Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. If you take that set of questions, and then I will start with the right wing of uh, this round. Ambassador Fahmy. Uh, these are great questions. Uh, let me address the first one. Uh, 
you sort of divided up the problems as being reform, economy, civil society versus security. I'll leave security aside because that's a technical issue that I can talk to you in detail. I actually believe that the, the most serious challenge is societal reform, which includes everything from civil liberties to uh, um, go governance issues and reform. Why I said I see progress, I'll give you a specific example. This does not mean, by the way, that I'm satisfied. It simply says that we're on the road. We could have done it better, and we need to do it even better. But the reason why I said I see some corrective measures as we go along, although I'm not yet satisfied with it. Recently, uh, the president called in the Minister of Interior. And in light of complaints made by individuals in different society, that in police stations they had not been treated uh, appropriately and so on and so forth. He called him and he asked him to look at the police law and uh, how they could be held accountable. Since then, he has been meeting different members of civil society, be they the intellectuals or today I think they, there was a, a meeting with a larger group. So uh, are we at the point where there is a societal consensus now and practices that are consistent with two revolutions in five years? No, we're not yet there. But is there a realization that we need to be more aggressive in a positive sense on the issue of reform? I think there is a realization there. And you hear this criticism uh, not only from the traditional opposition members, but you hear it even from centrists in the Egyptian public domain and in the media. So. I understand your frustration, but I still believe that uh, our direction is, is, is right. We need to make corrections. We are late. But um, I don't think one can ignore the fact that the self-corrective mechanism is, is, is there. I don't want to get into a debate about how much the military controls the economy. There's been a huge debate about this, and the figures are much less th th than what you're suggesting. Uh, I honestly believe that the economy is going to be one of the major determinants of success or failure of developing a modern day Egypt. Um, it's going to be in job creation and making sure that the growth is distributed equally or at least fairly among different members. And it will require all assets in the society to work on a equal opportunity competitive basis. If we don't do that, it will not be an efficient system. Uh, aid, you think I'm much older than I actually am because uh, 1.2 and 815 million was way back in 1996, uh, before I even came to Washington, by the way. Uh, it's 200 and something, so it's even gone down since I left. Uh, 150 billion, a million, excuse me, and 1.2 billion. 1.2 billion is the exact same amount, actually a little bit less, than what we were given in 79. And 1.2 billion in 2016 is much less than 1.2 billion in 79. Uh, so I, just the fact that it hasn't increased is a reflection of it's decreased in real terms. That being said, we have security problems. They're not state-to-state uh, -state problems. In other words, it's not that we're fighting Libya or are fighting Sudan or are fighting the Israelis. No, but there are serious security problems that we have on the ground in the Sinai and the Western Desert. And then we also have uh, the requirements of a strong regional state having a strong standing army. Uh, do we need more aid? No, I think we need more investment. Uh, I'd love to get more aid, but I don't think you can ever get enough aid to cover your economic problems. You need to create an economic environment where investors, and the first investor, by the way, is the local investor, not the international one. But you need to create uh, that environment. Secondly, you need to take advantage of where your value added is, or your advantage is. Our advantage, for many different reasons, we had a value added in tourism. Now, today, with the absence of security in certain areas in our region, it's impossible to sort of bring in tourists to the numbers where we'd like to see that. So, uh, if you can convince anybody in Congress to give us more economic aid, I don't know what's but uh, that's not really the solution to it. Uh, the, the great point, Marina, about children and our parents, uh, I'll be careful what I say in the future, 
<laughs> but you're right. I honestly believe I was being honest with you when I said it then, and I believe it's the case now. What I would add to it is that the parents are the ones who went wrong, not the children. The children came out and did what we couldn't do, but they were conveying our concerns about why we hadn't achieved the open society that we knew. They didn't know about it, by the way. They knew it was missing, and they sort of heard about these problems that we actually had lived. Where things went wrong is that we should have then added our nation-building experience to their hopes and energy and allowed for this transition to move forward. So uh, the transformation now is, it really is about their future, not about our concerns. It's about their future. If we are to succeed together, uh, it's about determining what they will have in the, in the future. And I think, frankly, uh, we have a huge responsibility to do that for our own national reasons as well as regional stability. Thank you. I'm going to start with a couple of questions from here. The gentleman in the front row. This one. Mr. Ambassador, welcome back to Washington. Uh, if there is something common about the Egyptians today, introduce yourself. <coughs> Ibrahim from the University of Maryland. If there's something common about the Egyptians now today is they are depressed. The rich, the poor, uh, those on the right, those on the left. And I'm calling on you to, to lead something that succeeded in Tunis, the equivalent of the quadrant, some kind of a national reconciliation in Egypt. Because I don't think you will see local or global investment. You're not going to see uh, really development, getting the house in order, as you described, until we get our own house in order. And that national dialogue is not happening. And I hope we're calling on you to do that. Thank you. Sir, third row. Uh, Dr. Awis, engineering consultant and from Towson University. Uh, I have a question and I'd like to hear from you. It's not a question, I'd like to hear from you actually on the, uh, uh, the dam on the Nile that has been uh, uh, started, almost going to be finished by Ethiopia. And also what would be your comment on some of the call themselves brothers, Gulf states, they are contributing to the build of the dam. And finally, there are reports, just reading in, in getting feedback, that the level of the, the water in the Nile is really drastically going down. Would you please comment on that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot of hands. <laughs> uh, the gentleman in the fourth row, fifth row. Keep your hand up, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Stand up. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Demetrius Jones, formerly with Deloitte Consulting, our international business resource group. I'm curious, what sort of inclusive efforts has this new government taken to legitimize some of the concerns of Egyptian youth, particularly considering the growing prowess of technology, not only in Egypt, just across the Arab world in general? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman in the second row has been very patient. Stand up so the mic can find you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Peter Humphrey, uh, Intel analyst and former diplomat. Sir, I'm wondering if you could shed a little light on this gift of the islands to uh, Saudi Arabia. Why would Saudi Arabia even make such a request? Uh, what's the strategic or tactical value of that? Uh, on, the gift of the on the islands, Tiran. And, uh, th let's take those four and then do another round. Can we take another four? No, I'm just joking. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> well, I. The idea that Egyptians are depressed, I think the Egyptians are frustrated that they didn't achieve more than what they have achieved so far, given expectations were so, so high uh, in 2011 in, in particular. So in that sense, yeah, there is a sense of frustration that we could have done better. I remember immediately after 2011 arriving at Geneva Airport, and on the one hand, you had a picture of Obama. Uh, with Egyptian uh, youth painting the sidewalks. And his comment was, Egyptian youth, we should, we should learn from the Egyptian youth. Berlusconi was on the other side of the corridor and was saying Egyptians are writing history again. So expectations were extremely high. Uh, and they were equally so domestically. So in that sense, I think there is a sense of frustration. Uh, I gave you one reason for it. I can go on and talk about uh, what happened after the elections, but that's will really be a waste of time. I think that the more we come around 
the constitution which we've developed. Rather than starting a, a national dialogue from scratch, I think we should create a national dialogue around the constitution. In other words, this is the constitution that's been adopted now by 98% of the population. Let's see what has to be done to fully implement these provisions of the constitution, which, by the way, on civil liberties is extremely strong. It's actually very progressive, very strong on civil liberties. And if it becomes truly embraced by the average Egyptian and civil society and by the institutions of government, you will see a significant movement forward. The other question you're sort of put in there, or I assume is in there, is, is there a, a room for reconciliation between political Islam and secularism in Egypt at the present time? I don't think there's room for that presently. Uh, because there is not yet, from that group in particular, a commitment to the Constitution. I would argue that let's talk about the Constitution first, create the momentum around that, and then we can look at the more difficult issues of how we move forward on that. Uh, but ultimately, yes, the national dialogue will be required, not in the technical sense, but in terms of what is modern-day Egypt. Um, Renaissance Dam. Ugh. Look, this is a win-win, lose-lose situation. Either the, the Ethiopians, the Egyptians, and the, and the Sudanese uh, find a way to balance the development needs uh, that they have with the water source needs that they have, or we're going to have a problem of major consequences. Uh, I don't think it's a situation where one side can win and the others can lose, uh, because frankly, you can't really have full potential development on a conflict of maritime source. And on the other hand, even if we were to pursue different water management uh, laws in Egypt, it still would never provide enough water if there was a conflict regarding the water source. We don't have another water source beyond the Nile. I think this is, it's important now, as, as you Americans like to say, the devil's in the details. It's not about general principles or statements. It's about what is the, what is the, de the text, what are the details they read upon. And unless there's a clear commitment um, that the water resources required by the different states are met, and like equally so, how are we going to deal with the development requirements um, this can be a very difficult situation. But on the other hand, I don't think that trying to use force as the answer to this, one way or the other, is the answer either. So I'm very worried about where the negotiations are at the moment. I'm very concerned, not because I don't understand difficult negotiations, but because I don't see any real examples of confidence building measures that would indicate good intentions of a detailed nature. Forget about the general principles. General principles are, are, are fair, but they don't. You can't take them to the bank at the end of the day. So I'm a little bit worried about the parties moving from assuming everything is a war scenario to moving everything is milk and honey and it's not. It's somewhere in the middle and the negotiations have to be detailed. I have had discussions with Gulf states regarding whether or not they're supporting the dam. They keep saying they're not, whether there are some individuals who have projects in Ethiopia. That's normal, by the way. Not everything you do in Ethiopia is a function of the dam. Uh, if, on the other hand, there is something that relates to the dam specifically, that's a different debate. But uh, let's, let's be a bit more cautious here on this. The uh, The, sure, I think the government is giving the issue of youth, let me put it this way, I think the Constitution provides every required response to the aspirations of youth to have an open society with equal rights and all the civil liberties required. So the, the, the provisions are there in the Constitution. 
Uh, I argue also that I think the government has made a serious effort to try to bring in the youth to the executive bodies, in other words, bringing them in to different governance, bringing them into different positions in ministries, and so on and so forth. But nevertheless, nobody seems to be satisfied. And the reason, frankly, is people want to see the practice, the institutions, the government, the civil society working in a fashion that's consistent with the provisions of the Constitution, and they also want to see more opportunities for the day-to-day -day requirements, uh, which are entry-level jobs and so forth. We have 10% unemployment rate at the educated youth level. It goes up to about 25%. And that's a very significant uh, challenge. The government has to find the balance between how do I create jobs and create a better theater for politics that deals with the aspirations of youth after two revolutions. So it still is a, a, a process that's ongoing. Uh, the islands, somebody said we were, that the, they were a gift. Uh, I need to look at the details of the agreement in more detail before expressing myself specifically uh, on the deal I've been traveling for the last two days. Uh, that being said, this whole process should have been much more transparent so that people can understand what exactly uh, what is the background of each of these cases. Uh, are, I mean, I'll give you a hundred different questions. First of all, are both islands the same? Uh, secondly, what is the maritime situation in terms of from one side of, the, of one island versus the other? On the one side you have the Saudis, on the other side you have the Egyptians. So there's a lot of detail here. Secondly, which map are you looking at? Uh, if you go back to the Osmanli map, they talk about one thing. If you go back to the Brits, it's about something else. And if you talk, look back at, at the, the Republic versus the Kingdom agreements, it's the third package. So I don't have a problem with correcting a wrong, but I think it should be done in a transparent, explicit fashion so that you don't raise concerns. Uh, and it should be done at the correct... I mean, we have to explain not only why we did things, but you need to also explain why you didn't do it before that. Because otherwise people will come and say, well, wasn't that the situation before? So it's again, it's part of the politic. Uh, last round of questions. I'll take somebody from the last, very last row. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Saim Yildiz uh, from Bahçeşehir University in Turkey. Uh, Turkey has seen as a role model for the countries in the region especially when the Arab Spring has started. So uh, do you think that still uh, Turkey can lead the countries in the region, uh, especially when we think about uh, Erdogan has still popularity among the population? Thank you. Thank you. There's a uh, gentleman in the, in the left there. I know there's a lot of people, uh, not enough time. Onji Dawadi from the Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy. Um, uh, your Excellency, you spoke about the commitment to the Constitution, and in response to one of the questions about a national dialogue, you said that we have to have a commitment from the other side to the Constitution. Uh, it's a Constitution that was written by only one side. Uh, the, the other side was not included. Actually, if we can let them out of jail, maybe they'll participate in some kind of national dialogue. I mean, we speak about Egypt now like, as if the, there's normal life of politics. There isn't. I mean, we all know that. There is, it's, a, it's a very military style rule, um, human rights organizations left and right all condemning Egypt. Hearings here in Congress, they're condemning Egypt for and, 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 and the deteriorating of human rights to say the least. So how can we speak about that, you know, as if it's a normal politics as usual when we know that the situation on the ground is not? Thank you. Uh, the lady in the front row. Microphone behind you. Hosseini, correspondent to Al-Hayan newspaper in Washington, D.C. Hamas leaders invited to Egypt in spite of, uh, they are accused of uh, uh, association of the attorney general. Uh, could, you, uh, could you please explain this? I don't understand. Last question from the gentleman in the back. Yeah, stand up so the microphone can find you. Thank you. Last question. Thanks. Uh, Abdullah Hindavi from George Mason University. Um, given the fact that you were a foreign minister of Egypt in a very critical time, how hard did you have to struggle to create your own foreign policy um, 
away from the influence that you could have um, seen or experienced from other security agencies within Egypt. As well, how can this power struggle within Egypt um, affect the Egypt's foreign policy making and its regional role? Thank you. Uh, I, issue of Turkey. I actually don't see Turkey as a role model for the Arab Middle East. Uh, not at all. And I don't actually believe that Turkey can lead the Arab Middle East at all. Uh, it's not Arab, so it can't possibly lead the Arab Middle East. It is an important country in the Middle East, and it's a country that is not going to go away, and therefore Arabs need to deal with Turkey uh, in a strategic fashion, and I think the Turks also need to deal with the Arab world in a strategic fashion and with some uh, uh, humility at the same time. Uh, and if you look at the, oh, the other question was about the Constitution. You know, it's a very interesting way you put this. I remember the Constitution developed in 2012, which actually was a committee that only included Islamists. And everybody else had been thrown out. Uh, I know, I know, I, I'm, I'm saying that that Constitution was actually done only when everybody else was asked to leave or wasn't allowed to continue. So the fact that we have a difference between Islamists and not Islamists, I've said openly that exists. And what I'm arguing really is anybody who wants to say he's Egyptian first and then anything else second, he can accept the constitution that I'm mentioning and we can start a dialogue. But if you want to tell me you are an Islamist or an Italian or whatever you are first and an Egyptian second, then frankly, there's no place for the discussion according to the Constitution. Uh, that's really my issue. And I also was very straightforward in saying, I would like to really see the spirit of the Constitution implemented by even those who agree with each other presently. And the issue of a national reconciliation, if it's possible, will come down the road. But I don't see one presently because I don't, I frankly believe that, at least in our experience in, in Egypt, the, the Islamist major mistake is that they thought that Egypt was part of the Islamist movement rather than the Islamist movement was part of Egypt. And you can change governments, but you can't change identity. Um, Hamas. Well, most of you are my friends, but I have to keep reminding even my friends, I'm not a member of the government. So, no, no, so I mean, I'm, I don't ask me to explain policy, but I will analyze it for you. Uh, look, there's clearly a problem between us and Hamas. There's no question about that. Uh, what's before the Attorney General in terms of, or the Minister of Interior, in terms of the criminal case, I don't have the details of that. But Hamas exists on the other side of our border. And uh, I think the message given to them when they came was extremely clear that there will be clear ramifications to any excesses. And these are, I don't want to say red lines or lines in the sand because there's a reputation to those kinds of things, but there are limitations and costs for what you will do if you go beyond that. If you don't do that, we don't deny the fact that you're part of the Palestinian political system. Whether we agree or disagree is relates to our policy but we don't deny that you're part of the Palestinian debate. And frankly, uh, it's a complexity or a complication that we have to live with. Same thing applies, frankly, in Libya. There are trends in Libya that we don't support, that we don't like, but they're part of the political trends in Libya. And we're going to have to decide, well, what needs to be done for them to be part of the process, even though we're not comfortable with it, and what rules them out of that process. So there will be these gray areas where it's not exactly uh, clear why we would bring somebody in uh, and accuse them of, of something, but I don't think it's inconsistent with uh, what we're facing by day-to-day -day life today. The, uh, what was the last question? Did you foreign policy were you and able to make your own foreign policy? Oh, great question. <laughs> I can go on for hours with, with that. <coughs> but let, let me address this uh, personally, seriously personally. I had been asked to be a foreign minister three times before and refused every single time. 
And when I said yes, all of my really close friends were sure I was gonna say no. But I said yes, uh, and I'm proud that I did and I have no problem at all. I asked myself one question before I said yes. What would the foreign minister have to do after two revolutions? I knew the technicalities because I was a diplomat, but okay, what is the new message? And the word that struck in my mind most from, two, from 2013, 2000 was freedom. The word freedom kept coming up in both times. And in foreign policy, it's not about civil liberties. Dome that's domestic policy. It's about freedom of choice and options. And therefore, I announced four days after I came into office the parameters, the guidelines, the objectives of our foreign policy for the next year, and I said I would leave after that. And among those parameters, where we would have a multidimensional foreign policy, we would expand our friends and, 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 and work from our regional base internationally. So I think the word freedom was the, the force that really made all the other battles or non-battles uh, worth it, frankly. And secondly, I've lived in this country for, for a number of years and I've been in other countries as well. You always have turf battles, so what? It's part of, part of the process, and there's always some overlap between the functions of one ministry and one institution and the other. That's true, it actually does exist. But they both have different functions. So I can tell you, in all honesty, uh, the message was so clear to me in that word freedom that I didn't feel that I didn't know what the direction was, although we were, so to speak, in an interim phase from one point to the other. And I didn't frankly waste time on whether there was somebody who liked or disliked this because after two revolutions you have responsibility to the people. It's not, it gives you to yourself as a foreign minister tremendous freedom to act, but you also have a responsibility that's much heavier than you would in the past. So uh, I can tell you war stories all we want about this, but the real message I drew from this is that that of responsibility and that, that word freedom, which sort of continues to ring to this day in my mind. Thank you, Ambassador Fahmi. I know we will meet many times again to discuss Egypt in the future. I hope developments there will more closely match you know, our hopes uh, uh, for, for Egypt. Uh, thank you all for being here and being so patient. Please join me in thanking <laughs> Ambassador Fahmi.